Hello and welcome back to Hard On Hardware. Now, before I start with anything, I just want to apologize for the weird background, um, but this is the place in the house with the best lighting, so I thought, why not? And now with that out the way, let's get on to some benchmarks. And once again, before I start with the actual benchmark figures, if you haven't seen my previous videos on the actual build with some tasty b-roll of it, I'll leave a link in the video description below for you to have a look at that first, and then you can see the actual benchmark figures. Now, before I actually give any figures, I thought it was quite important for me to go through the process that I used for the benchmarking. Uh, because when I wanted to start making this video, I thought, wow, this is probably going to be the easiest part. I mean, how difficult can it really be to benchmark a machine? You install the games that you want to benchmark on the PC, and then you press F11 while you're playing, and then record for a bit, and there you go, you've got your benchmarks done. But it turns out it was a lot more difficult than that, um, especially with the game that I started out with. So the first game that I wanted to use as a benchmark is Battlefield 1, which I really enjoy playing, so I thought it's a good place to start. But I realized very quickly that I was getting very uh, schizophrenic results. I mean, each test I did had wildly different frames per second, with the same map, the same match even. Um, so then I realized I had to kind of look at my testing methodology and try something different. So how I started out the testing with Battlefield was I thought that what I do is I play a match. Uh, in the beginning of the match, I would start recording the benchmark and then finish it as the match ends. I thought this would be an accurate way to test it because there'd be enough gameplay time to kind of overcome the long bits where you're busy waiting to choose where you spawn and so on. Because obviously when you're in menus, the frame rate is higher. But it meant that I was getting really inconsistent results because, well, you die more in some matches than others, and having those ta those moments that you're in the actual kind of menus in the benchmark isn't very good because, well, the frame rate is obviously a lot higher then. So then what I decided to do was try and record uh, benchmarks as I was alive playing in the match, and this went fairly decently because like the results were, were more consistent. But because each time you're recording, you're playing in a different part of the match and there's kind of different action going on. So it's quite difficult to get kind of lab level accuracy, which, you know, it is a video game, so you're almost definitely not gonna get that. Um, but then I kind of stopped with Battlefield for a while and started benchmarking things like Tomb Raider and um, Ashes of the Singularity, which are great to benchmark because they have their own benchmarking tools built into the actual game, which means you can get really consistent results, um, which is really useful. After all of that, I decided, no, I have to tackle Battlefield again. And I decided to load up the single player game because well, in the single player game, first of all, you die much less because it's much easier and you can replay the same bit of game over and over and over and over again, which means you can get much more consistent results. And that's exactly what I did. And after I did that, I got really consistent results. I got it to the point where there was less than half a frame per second deviation between each time I ran the benchmark. And I was pretty happy with that because it meant that every single time that I change some variable of PC component, that was going to be what changes the actual benchmark result. Because I could have just chosen one at random from the first results or just averaged them all together, but it wouldn't have worked out very well because it was a difference of like some of the recordings you'd get 70 frames per second average and some of them you'd get like 95. And that's way too big a gap to actually use as reliable data. But yeah, I actually think I got it down to quite a good place. So without further ado, I'm gonna start with the benchmark. Thank you. 
And there we have it. Those were the figures that came from the system behind me there. And it's actually not hugely a surprise. I mean, they're pretty much in line with all of the reviews that you read of the of the GTX 1060. Uh, it's an absolute monster at 1080p. Uh, you can play everything at ultra and still get pretty high frame rates. It struggled quite a bit with Ashes of the Singularity, but I think there was definitely some degree of CPU limitation in there. Um, something which I can discuss a bit later because I do have another graphics card that I'm going to test in that machine. So we'll see how much the actual frame rates, um, I think it was about 43, um, for Ashes of the Singularity was down to an actual CPU limitation rather than a GPU one. Um, but it was the, the, the GPU spec specific benchmark. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know, it might be because of the graphics card, but we'll put that to the test in a bit. Um, yeah, everything ran really well at 1080p. Rise of the Tomb Raider got really high frame rates. And it was actually quite surprising how little of a difference there was between DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 when it came to Rise of the Tomb Raider. Um, so it's definitely not like AMD where you get a big performance increase, you pretty much get the same frame rate. Um, so yes, I'd highly recommend the card for 1080p. Not quite high frame per second 1080p, so if you've got like a 140 hz monitor, maybe go to something like at least a 1070. Um, but if you have a 60 Hz 1440p monitor, you can get away, kind of get away with it. Um, you might have to turn the settings down a teeny bit, but I was playing Battlefield 1 at 1440p for, for a while and it was really decent. Um, it performs well enough for it to be more than acceptable to play online. Um, it is obviously a lot, a lot snappier at 1080p though. Um, yes, all in all, um, oh yes, I do have to explain the overclock on the, the CPU. I took it to 4.5 gigahertz because at that point it was already running at quite a high temperature um, with the, the cooler on it that I currently have. I could push it further, but I don't want to, I, I don't want to push it to the limit um, necessarily. And when it comes to overclocking the graphics card, it's actually really difficult overclocking this specific pallet card because well, the actual software or the actual GPU itself with GPU Boost 3 takes it pretty much to the limit of what it would do. Um, when I tried overclocking any further, it just crashed almost immediately. Um, so yeah, I think as far as a manual overclock goes, there's not a huge amount of headroom left in the graphics card. But temperatures on that, were it was really good. Um, the cooler is great. Uh, but I think, you know, there's quite a lot of airflow in the case as well. so. Um, yeah, the open shroud design isn't too much of an issue. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this trilogy of videos detailing the girlfriend build that I have back here. Uh, I've got a bunch more content coming, so do subscribe if you want to see that. Like the video if you liked it, dislike it if you don't, because apparently all of it helps. I don't know how, but I'm not going to argue with that. And yes, thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye-bye.